This is high. <laughs> Recording in progress. Recording in progress. All right, we're doing good. Yeah, we're doing great. How's the audio from here? We've got a fan on because can you hear us okay, Ellie? It's been sweltering. Yeah, I hear you, no problem. Okay, good. So it'll be true for me throughout this. Once in a while, we get some street noise here. But... Yeah. Well, this room is about 100,000 degrees, but Kathy's got a gigantic fan by the door. We're probably going to look like supermodels with our hair blowing in the breeze. But, you know, okay. What do you think? Good. Yeah? Amy, count us in. Okay. All right, everybody's muted. Everybody's good. Everybody's smiling. Peter Gorse is here. Da, 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 da. And did you da, not da, notice da, we're da, together da, in the same da, 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 da. It's madness. Okay. Here I go. Share sound. Share Ellie. Share it. Find the song. Just a moment. <laughs> See what happens? Now you're with me when this happens. Are you ready? Yeah. We could dance a little. Well, it's the end of the week. Now where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday. So come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday. We're on the loose. We'll be the train. You be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Oh my God, you guys, you just don't know. <laughs> it's easier when there's more room to flail, <laughs> but hey, welcome, welcome, welcome to Feedback Friday episode 102. <laughs> Here we are in the same room broadcasting live from Seattle, Washington, where we're having an unprecedented heat wave that is, we've just been enduring, um, but today's a little bit cooler, so we're thankful for that. Um, I'm Kathy Hattori, president of Botanical Colors. We're sitting here in my studio trying to stay cool. Amy is here right next to me. Holy moly, am I? It's not virtual reality, it's reality. And we're so pleased to welcome you today. Uh, Feedback Friday is our show where we speak with artists, activists, writers, scholars, scientists, uh boy all sorts of folks who are interested in our favorite topic which is natural dyes and color is it it is it really is we spent the whole week doing this <laughs> right so today on feedback friday we are really really thrilled to welcome socially engaged artist and educator ellie irons uh i was on ellie's website and there's just some really amazing projects and places she has gone to look at the geography of climate change in urban areas. Um, just seeing how she is looking at what's happening in our uh, areas that are impacted by urbanization, industrialization, and of course, what the impacts of climate change are. And the things that are actually growing and thriving rather than um, what we often will see, which is where they're being uh, impacted, where they can't, they can no longer um, survive well. So uh, Ellie's been examining the effects of climate change in her art for over a decade. So she really has a deep, deep uh, inquiry and understanding into what's going on. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear her uh, talk about it because I think we're really gonna see someone who's looked at it for over 10 years now and what that means and what she's seeing. And then also kind of, of helping us reframe what we call something what we typically will call a weed into something that is, is much more uh, interesting and powerful and possibly even mitigating. So I'm, I'm excited. Um, a little housekeeping for us. Amy is our moderator on the call. And so she's gonna keep everybody muted while Ellie is presenting. 
and then open up the chat after so you can uh, type in your questions for Ellie. Um, and this call is being recorded as always, and we'll have it available for you after the show. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Ellie Irons, who's joining us. And Ellie, thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. It's really a pleasure to be here with this community. You all are amazing and share so many of my interests. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll make sure that that all works as expected. You see in my first slide. Yeah, looks right. Awesome. Sorry, yes, yes. <laughs> cool, I can see you now. Sorry. We had a few struggles with this this week, so we're we're celebrating already. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kathy and Amy, for that invitation and that warm welcome. Your song is uh, so much fun. <laughs> um, I'm talking to you from Mohican land in current day upstate New York, and I'll be talking about feral invasive pigments, learning with and from weeds through eco-social art. I'm gonna break this talk into three parts roughly. So first I'm gonna give you a little introduction to my work and get us situated theoretically and geographically. Then I'll get into the nuts and bolts of how I make watercolor paints from weedy plants. And we'll wrap up with just a little bit more reflection on how this work functions in the wider world. And I'm really looking forward to um, some questions and comments later. So. To get us oriented a little bit, as you heard, I'm an artist and educator, and I practice what I think of as eco-social art, a form of socially engaged interdisciplinary artistic practice. I combine ecological art and socially engaged art through a multi-species lens, meaning I engage with more than human life and land as active partners. Um, and I take social engagement and interaction as a primary artistic medium. This means I use walks and work workshops and other participatory events. Um, but I also use more traditional artistic techniques like painting, drawing, video, and sculpture. And all of this is driven towards creating art that's aimed at trying to understand and live with the ecological and the social as interdependent and entangled. And while I think I've been working towards this kind of practice, my whole life. This current vein started in earnest about a decade ago when I started making watercolor paints out of the weedy plants living around my studio in Bushwick, Brooklyn. I'll get a bit more into that work shortly, but we'll, we'll ground ourselves a little bit more first. Over the past decade, since I started painting with weeds, I've become particularly engaged with forms of eco-social art that cultivate what I think of as plant-human solidarity. I think teaching and learning with and from plants, which I call phytocentric pedagogy, is one way to build that cross-species allyship, which, along with many others, I understand as essential to the future of increasingly urban human communities navigating, as we heard, climate chaos and its associated injustices. And as I explored in the dissertation I just created um, for my work with Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, I'm committed to learning with and from disturbance-oriented plants who are experts at taking the first steps towards healing land that's been damaged by industrialization, urbanization, and extraction. That includes plants like this pokeweed plant sprouting from toxin-filled soil that's been capped with cement and gravel as a remediation method. My practice is dedicated to conspiring with these plants in the sense described by artist and anthropologist Natasha Myers to lessen the harms of our compromised times. And that's a phrase that I draw from feminist philosopher, Alexis Shotwell. Reclaiming the term weedy from its derogatory associations, this orientation has grown out of hands-on collaborative work in habitats that are often overlooked as sites of natural cultural value, like this car repair yard turned urban weeds garden. This was the headquarters of my artist collective, the Environmental Performance Agency in 2017. And these disturbed habitats also include urban sidewalks and streets with their fragmented plant communities and locked away soil. And of course, the intensively managed greenery of monocultural lawns like the National Mall in Washington, DC. 
each of these habitats springs from land damaged by the extractive pressures of capitalism and settler colonialism. And I recognize these as ecocidal, ecocidal systems. Um, and I, I recognize also that I'm complicit in them. Uh, following Potawatomi writer and plant biologist Robin Wall Kimmerer, weedy plants, whether they're native or naturalized where they sprout, rebuild and repair damaged land. They prepare the way for recovery. That little sprout circled there really wants to be a tree, maybe a honey locust. Uh, teachings and learnings like this have led me to ongoing projects like the Laundry Disturbance Laboratory, which over the past four years has seen me and my core collaborator, Anne Fricoco, and many others remove roughly a thousand pounds of turf from a range of lawns. We've done this to make collaborative sculptures with communities of humans and plants, experimenting with communal unlawning through a melding of sculpture, plant human stewardship, and urban ecology protocols. This has given us a container in which to stretch, refine, undo, and strengthen our concerns, questions, assumptions, even our dreams and desires for living lawns differently into the future. Um, we're doing our best to open ourselves up to what the plants in each place we work with can tell us about the land, what the land can support, what the plants in the land can do on their own and where we can collaborate and assist them. Before I go further, I'm gonna return briefly to the fact that I'm speaking today from Mohican land. Like I said, this is land currently known as Troy, New York. It's a post-industrial town full of weedy plant life. We're perched on the edge of the massive, magnificent and deeply polluted Mahikanituk River, also known as the Hudson. And given my interest in learning from and with plants, it feels really essential to acknowledge that the indigenous peoples of this region, including the Mohican, Haudenosaunee, Mansi Lenape, have long understood plants as active agents in the world, as relatives, and in some cases as teachers. As a settler on this land, an orientation towards plant agency and plant wisdom is something I'm attuning to right now as an adult. And I do this work in deference to and with a lot of gratitude for the many living knowledge systems that have shepherded myriad forms of indigenous botanical knowledge across the centuries. I also always try to keep in mind a commitment to remaining attuned to this really slippery shifting terrain between amplification and allyship of those ways of knowing and extraction and exploitation. Um, it's complicated. I'm gonna pause for a moment to sit with that gratitude and that complexity. If you'd like to, please join me in taking a few deep breaths. You could look away from the screen for a moment, maybe just above and beyond it, and breathe. Thanks for doing that with me. Um, that gave me a moment to notice an amazing thunderhead that's building outside my window. We're hoping for rain here later. Um, so while I've been working with lawns for the past four years, I didn't jump right into work with manicured spaces. This orientation towards disrupting monoculture habitats has grown out of engagement with weedy plant life that started along the streets and sidewalks of Muncie Lenape land in Brooklyn, New York. Where, as I mentioned earlier, about 10 years ago, I started harvesting spontaneous urban plants, also known as weeds, to make watercolor paint. I made paintings about the plants I harvested from, and I started teaching others how to do the same through walks and workshops. This expanded what had been a solo studio practice and connected it directly to the living landscape right outside my studio doors. And it really helped bring the socially engaged component of my work to life. Through hands-on research, I started practicing what I've come to think of as public field work in urban habitats. This is getting out in the streets, drawing attention to the value and vibrancy of the living land, and engaging with weedy urban plants and their habitats this way has brought up a ton of fraught questions around belonging and nativeness and the agency of plants and land. And I found as I got to know these plants, I just started by stepping out the door and not really knowing them. I got to know them and I learned they were cosmopolitan beings. Um, this painting here shows pokeweed, 
native to the lands now known as the Southeastern United States, and shows how it's migrated following flows of commerce and human migration around the temperate world. So from South Africa and Southeastern Australia to the cities of Japan. Well, Asiatic dayflower in blue, which was originally evolved in Japan, or is cultivated for pigment, has migrated to the United States where it lives in cities. And it's also gaining notoriety as a super weed in Roundup Ready soybean fields. Um, and to get a little bit at terminology, I certainly could have called this project my weedy pigments project, but these other terms floated up to the top for a couple of reasons. Um, for one thing, feral for me is a term that's often associated with animal life. So I feel like using it to talk about plants helps center plant agency, which I hope also helps dismantle this hierarchical ex exclusionary way of thinking about humans as the top of everything. Um, in that way, you're kind of um, disassembling the damaging genre um, that Sylvia Winter frames as man with a capital M. And then for me, feral also resonates with um, scholar Catriona Sandiland's feral feminism. She has some really amazing writings about um, how these beings exist somewhere between our common assumption about what is wild and what is domesticated or cultivated. And in that way, they can further trouble these Cartesian Euro-Western tendencies to think in binary divisions, which are so damaging. So when it comes to this plant, sure, Asiatic dayflower grew without being directly planted by a human but my lifestyle and that of others like me makes their existence possible. They act invasively in some situations, as mentioned in Roundup Ready soybean fields in the Midwestern United States, where they've developed resistance to Monsanto's glyphosate-based herbicide Roundup and are known as a superweed. But in East Asia, one of the places they evolved and are considered native, they're showing the ability to thrive in intensely contaminated soils of old copper mines. So in both cases, the pressure placed on the planet by contemporary Western and global elite lifestyles, we need copper for electricity. Um, from the warming climate, to the dense built environment we have in places um, like this sidewalk pictured here in New York City. These aspects are rendering life impossible for coastal cordgrass, which would have grown here 500 years ago, but very possible for this tough weedy wildflower who's tolerant of heavy metals and herbicides and can somehow grow out of the side of a building. Like, amazing. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I come back to again and again when thinking about weediness and feralness and invasiveness. What is the context? What's the habitat and who's being harmed by this introduced migrant plant and who might be benefiting? Are they growing exuberantly, just barely hanging on? Or have they naturalized? And of course, even native plants can act invasively if conditions change in a way that favors their growth over that of other organisms. And will this happen more with climate change? It might, probably it will. <laughs> um, so given this context, I'm really interested in a harm reduction approach that weighs the pluses and minuses of management and tending and reciprocal relationships with exuberant plants. And these questions have just kept me engaged with this project over decades, when I first, or a decade anyway. When I first started it, I, you know, I thought I'd do it for a season. Um, but I keep going out into the field again and again. And I find that being out in the field in these urban wilds, if you want to call them that, um, leads to other projects. It starts to awaken me um, to the way plants are guiding and teaching me to work. Um, and I'm looking for other ways to open folks up to that. In the instance of this ongoing project, as I was out looking for color for paint, I started to see and collect other bits of color left in the landscape by humans. And looking at this, I'm wondering which of these arrangements is really invasive. How do we think about the ubiquitous endocrine disrupting properties of degrading but never disappearing microplastics in relationship to the cyclical color of so-called invasive plant life, which will decompose and cycle back into the system it came from if we let it. This is New York City. Of course, many municipalities don't let these plants cycle back into the soil. So it's these complexities and frictions, what's trash, what's valuable, what's a resource, what's a burden that has sustained my work with feral and invasive pigments over so many years. So that's a little bit of a kind of theoretical framework and background. 
And with that, I want to build in another little pause to let that sink in and let our brains work. And remember, we have bodies. So we're going to take a moment to detune from the screen and towards vegetable life. If you'd like to join me, we'll start with a question. Do you know where the sun is right now? Take a moment to consider this question. And now can you rotate your face, shoulders, and torso to greet it, even if it's out of view, even if it's below the horizon? And just take three deep breaths from this position. And we can return to the screen. So thanks again for taking a break with me. With that, I'd like to return us to paint making so I can share my process in a bit more detail. I'll start with a current pigment project. Over the last six months or so, I've been working on a new palette, investigating the feral ecologies of a small slice of land. It's currently known as Hudson, New York. So current day Hudson is another post-industrial town. It's about 20 miles south of Troy on the Mahikanituk, also known as the Hudson. And for this project, I'm focusing on a portion of land around the art and performance venue Basilica Hudson. I'm an artist in residence there right now with Toolshed, which is a project by artists Susanna Saylor and Ed Morris. And Basilica is at the beginning of this decade-long plan where they want to build in more climate resiliency to their site. Um, they're looking at sustainability and environmental justice issues in the floodplain. Their building exists on Mohican lands that were marshed in estuary prior to colonization, and the land the building's on is still referred to as the South Bay, um, even though this watery landscape has been cut off from the river and filled in. There's abandoned factories, a gravel quarry, railroad tracks, the county correctional facility, all built on land that was once estuarial marsh tied to tidal flows that are coming up the river from New York City, um, the New York Harbor really, and, and the Atlantic beyond it. And the Basilica plan in the end will likely involve a landscaping firm and they'll put in native plantings and probably a lot of tending will be involved, which is great. Um, but along with the tool shed folks, I'm interested in acknowledging the vibrant feral and invasive ecologies that have emerged on the site over the past several centuries. And approaching the site through this lens of feral and invasive paint making gives me a chance to document, but also engage with, appreciate, and, and further share out um, the important work that these plants have done to green and heal a landscape inundated by industrialization and extraction. So I started work in the slow, quiet months of winter, and I've continued through the warming, thawing days of spring, and now into our steamy, too dry summer that we've been experiencing here. Along the way, we've held some walks and workshops, and the plan is that I'll wrap up in the fall with a complete four season palette that will become part of Toolshed's lending library so people can check it out and paint with plants. So season by season, I've been collecting and experimenting with different plants. This is a group I collected back in January. Some are familiar to me, some are new experiments. And I'm also collecting detritus and plant photos for color wheel and old bits of iron, which I'm using to make ferrous sulfate. I'm sure many of you being a dye oriented community are familiar um, that with this as a mordant that can alter the color, like do some deepening and darkening. Um, so I got a railroad spike and sat it in a mixture of water and vinegar back in January. Uh, it looks more like this today. I also have some commercially produced ferrous sulfate, but I haven't tried it yet. I'm super curious um, to compare the two. I probably will do that shortly. So moving into technical and process aspects of this project, 
I use a range of tools and techniques that are adopted from a variety of traditional centuries old watercolor recipes to make plant based watercolor paint. And the main tools and ingredients are pretty basic kitchen stuff and a few tools that are more specialized for art and science. I try to keep it simple because I like the process to be accessible when I teach it. Um, easy to travel with and super portable for doing workshops. So I'll, I'll go over the tools. Um, here you can see we have a stainless steel mortar and pestle. This is available anywhere from like Target to your neighborhood thrift store if you get lucky. <laughs> um, I also like to have a nice flexible kitchen spatula, like the kind used for baking or frosting. Um, a glass sheet with polished, polished edges, painter's palette is one way to get it, but also a glass cutting board can work really well if it's smooth on one side, very affordable. Um, so also a glass muller, some of you might know this as a specialized paint making tool. Um, it's available from glass blowers and art specialty stores. It's not totally essential, but I really enjoy using it. So I tend to bring them to workshops and let folks try it out at least. I use a thin flexible palette knife like a metal one. This is also something you'll find at an art store in the painting section. A metal mesh broth strainer are also used sometimes for lifting dumplings out of a fryer um, as fine as possible. I got this one at my local 99 cent store, but any other fine metal mesh um, works fine too. And also not essential but helpful are some small plastic pipettes, they're kind of like little tiny mini um, eyedroppers. They're commonly used in biology labs, but you could use any kind of eyedropper. Um, and sometimes I find tweezers and small scissors helpful for sorting plant parts. And all of this can kind of be packed up into a portable kit is the idea. Um, so for ingredients that actually go into the paint, of course we need plant parts um, pictured here are some wine berries I just collected at Basilica. I haven't actually made paint with them, but they're on deck. I use gum Arabic as the main binder for my paints, totally traditional ingredient and watercolor paints. I also use different kinds of water. Here I have distilled water, like is typically used in biology labs, and what I call field water, which is this case collected from a local creek where I was harvesting plants. And then rounding out the ingredients I usually use is local honey. You can use any kind, but I love to get it from a you know, local beehive, um, as well as a few mordants I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, crystallized alum I get online and this homemade ferrous sulfate. And this materials list is mostly available in a handbook I made about the project. It needs to be updated. I'm working on that. Hopefully it'll be out this fall, um, but it has the basics and you can download it from my website. Um, the handbook also includes information on the paint making process, which I'll jump into now. And I thought for this portion we could follow a plant that I worked with recently. Um, this is Lotus corniculatus, also known as bird's foot trefoil. It's a really common site in the northeastern United States right now, especially with the drought like conditions we've been having, because everyone's lawn is turning crispy and brown, but the bird's foot trefoil is staying green and still blooming because it can evade the mower. It's like comfy hanging out there at lawn level. They're also really common around Basilica's campus. I found this amazing patch climbing around in this rubble pile near the tool shed lending library. I collect different amounts depending on what I'm making or the use I have in mind, but for this batch of paint, I collected about a cup of blossoms. Um, and then back in the studio, there's a couple different ways to go about this, but I found it's good to separate the particular portion of the plant you want to use, whether it's the um, just the petals or leaves or berries, um, even sometimes the stamen and pistils for pollen um, from the rest of the plant it, right away while it's fresh. And then from that point, you can dry it or freeze it. I tend to work with them fresh or just from the refrigerator. Um, but with, with a lot of plants, you can, you can store it that way. I tend to like to make the paint and then store the paint. Um, so for this uh, bird's foot trefoil, I took just the petals and used them fresh. I put around two tablespoons of plant material. It varies depending on the plant and the quantity you need into my mortar and pestle. And like I said, stainless steel tends to work best with the process, smooth, easy to clean out. 
and doesn't add any kind of contaminant to the process as you're grinding. Um, I add a dollop of acacia gum syrup, also known as gum arabic, which, as I mentioned, is the traditional binder for watercolor paints. And uh, yeah, I'll go into this a little bit. Um, gum arabic can be described as a natural plant product. Um, it's made from the sap of a few different types of acacia trees that are native to Northern Africa. So we don't have a source for that that lives here in the United States. Um, it's also a highly commodified product. From what I understand, it's largely harvested by hand in current day Sudan and other countries in Northern Africa, mostly from wild growing trees, but also increasingly from um, planted seedlings. Um, and folks who harvest it do it by hand and they make it available to a global supply chain. And there's a few big corporations that sell the lion's share of gum arabic. And, it, you know, I've looked a little bit at like fair trade and direct trade options. They're mostly aimed at like food industry. It's used in a lot of like soda pop. Um, but I tend to get mine, you know, from art stores. So I, I went into that because while the paint I make is plant-based, it's not local or pure. It's this hybrid, complex, non-innocent um, product. Um, and these next few slides are shots from a video I made a while back about my process. You saw me adding a few drops of gum arabic as a binder, binds the pigment to the paper, um, creates this kind of luminosity from the light being able to go through it, because it's clear, um, that's characteristic of watercolor paints. Add a little bit of that honey that I mentioned, just like a pin drop, pinhead size drop for flexibility and its antimicrobial properties. And add a little water, like I said. Um, and I find that if I add field water versus the less reactive distilled water, uh, this is from a holding plant that was near an old salt quarry um, or salt pile um, for road salt, um, it has different impacts. Um, that's the distilled water. I grind these ingredients together. I send them through sieves of different fineness to remove the plant fibers and other residue. And then the plant, uh, paint drips out onto a, that glass sheet that I mentioned. And that's when I get out the molar. And I use the molar um, to make sure the pigment and the binder are thoroughly mixed and the paint is as smooth as possible. And at this point, depending on the use and the plant I'm working with, I'll divide the paint into multiple batches and add importance that shift the color to some of them. So with that um, bird's foot trefoil, I added ferrous sulfite and the yellow dark into this deeper olive. And then to another batch, I added a few grains of alum and that pushed it slightly in a warmer orange direction. And I was also kind of interested to see that I got a brighter, truer yellow with this field water that was harvested from the holding pond than I did with the distilled water. So I love thinking of plants as these little chemical factories that are pumping out these amazing compounds that then I can interact with in the studio. So I end up with several shades of paint from each plant and they can dry in these little cups and they could be stored long-term or painted with immediately at that point. And as my palettes for different areas and projects grow, I'll experiment with telling the stories of the plants through paintings and drawings and photography and videos. This is just a little in-progress piece um, for Hudson. It's a small map painting based on the grid and the hard-edged outline of the municipal boundaries of Hudson. It divides the land that's in Hudson from the rest of the land around it. And the city actually extends partway into the Hudson, but there's little bays that are carved out that aren't part of the city. Um, but the spontaneous feral and invasive plants wind their way in and around the urban and industrial land use pattern um, complicating and contesting it. And it does take some getting used to to work with these paints. They can be a bit recalcitrant and finicky. Some plants are easier to paint with than others. Um, but I like that variation. I think of it as a conversation with the plant and what it has to offer. And this is often a question. Yes, the, the pigments do deteriorate over time if they're exposed to harsh UV light. I'm OK with that. It's also part of the cycle of working with a living material that isn't biologically inert. Um, sometimes I go back to old pieces and update them with new pigments. I'll make a note, kind of explain when I did it and where the paint came from, and kind of get these layers of history on a single piece. 
And this means returning to the same plant season after season, year after year, sometimes to discover they've been hidden away under a concrete parking lot or a new building foundation. Other times I'm happy to find that they're flourishing. Um, this is a meadow full of disturbance oriented wildflowers. This is just my last little wrap up passage, last couple minutes, um, who are considered native in Brooklyn. Um, this meadow has white snake root, goldenrod, horseweed. I used to visit this space often, and I found it to be doing a tremendous amount of eco-social work, from stress reduction to air quality improvement, to soil enrichment, to flood mitigation. If you zoom out, it's actually behind a chain link fence. It's framed by so-called invasive plants, uh, Japanese knotweed, tree of heaven, white mulberry. This is them all flourishing together in October. And then this is the same co plant community in the spring a year later. Um, when the site was maintained in the most brutal way possible with a bulldozer. Uh, this resets the cycle of recovery and renewal. This is a couple months later. The disturbance oriented plants, those weedy ones that jump into a crisis, they stabilize the soil until other plants can come along and jump in. And so we get that kind of flux that animates a lot of urban plant habitats. And the photos here are all part of my ongoing research and photo project, feral landscape typologies. This is another thing the plants led me to do by looking for paint. I started noticing these patterns um, of the types of spaces these plants live in. Um, so I'm documenting the fact that a lot of corner lots are hard to build on and left open, for instance. Um, and this transition over a period of time where it turns into a patio. Right, this patio offers certain affordances that the feral green space didn't have, and it shouldn't necessarily be the responsibility of individuals to fill the city with green space. Right, lack of green space is an environmental and eco social justice issue that should be addressed systemically as well. But re regardless, um, as these spaces disappear, um, they're often unrecognized and unrecorded, so we don't get a sense of the the benefit that they were having prior. And yeah, just to wrap up, um, this approach to maintenance and stewardship in these spaces is something that I continue to think about as I harvest pigments from them. Um, I'm always asking, when do we do more harm than good by treating certain plants as the enemy? What does an ethic of care rather than control look like when it comes to relationships with living land? Um, can more human hands tending the land help disrupt some of these vicious cycles of disturbance and violence? and looking to weeds, following the cues of phytocentric pedagogy through this process of collecting and making paint um, is a small intervention, intervention, right? It's a tiny move, um, but it feels to me like one way to forge links um, to other communities like you all, um, related projects in the arts and beyond that are pushing back against monoculture and building plant human solidarity. So really happy to have gotten to share with you and to hear your thoughts and questions. Uh, thank you. And that's some of the uh, sources that I mentioned, if y'all are interested in, in reading. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ellie. Awesome. It's so incredible. Are we unmuted? Yes, we're unmuted. Ellie, thank you. That was, that was really kind of mind blowing for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a weed puller. So I'm just like, wow, what am I doing? Me too, in the right context. I mean, I want my tomatoes and my basil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's fantastic. I'm pretty envious about the pokeweed availability. Um, yeah. yeah, that's one of my favorites. I'm going, turn it, I'm going to turn it over to Amy, and uh, she's going to start asking you a bunch of questions. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Oh, I'm going to spotlight Ellie. You get oh, no, I have spotlighted Ellie. Great. Let's see. Um, I'm just going to dive in. Sure. See, how, so how do you get permission to enter, I guess, enter a space like in the last one in Brooklyn? Sure. Great question. So um, when I was living in Brooklyn, it was a combination. Sometimes it was just me finding a way in. And, you know, there's a, a lot of issues around who has access to space like that. Um, white privilege is certainly at play there. I can enter a space like that and be less likely to get the cops called on me. And if they are called, <laughs> suffer less consequences. Um, I've been told to leave a couple times, but never 
you know, nothing ever came of it. Um, but also I worked with folks um, who were from the parks department. So once you get, you know, kind of in with uh, folks who are working on transitioning vacant space, city owned space to um, parks or urban gardens or something like that, often I would be able to get access to do a survey before the work started. So, um, yeah. and then sometimes just um, folks who own land, you know, actually approaching the landowner and asking if I can access the space and do a project there. So, yeah. um, let's see, curious to know if you have tried making oil-based paints. Have you tried pine sap as a binder? Love your work. Oh, cool. I have not, but that would be a really interesting thing to think about since we have such a plethora of pines in this area. And I bet it would be sensorially very interesting. So mm -hmm. I'll, yeah, I'll think about it. I'm not sure if you now you and Natalie Stopka know each other already, but do you two know each other? Oh my goodness. Oh well I'll make that intro after <laughs> Natalie's uh loves doing what you do. Cool. All, and embracing that whole world of inks. Awesome. Um so Natalie wrote, thank you for introducing us to alternate ways and words thinking about invasive species. I recently learned the word ruteral, the first plants to appear in disturbed ground from the Latin for rubble. Can you talk about ways that mapping, charting, and cataloging draw your audience into the particular beauty of feral plants? That's one part. And what is the best way to sensitize people to something they might not have found beautiful previously? Ah, oh, very rich question. And yeah, that rural terminology has been helpful for me too. I really like how rural um, bridges um, the scientific community coming out of like rural biology um yeah we could go there's there's some really wonderful writing and research about rural landscapes um but yeah in terms of getting folks to stop and notice it's a huge challenge right and i find that one of the reasons i i do this a lot of different ways so i have you know a variety of collaborative and um solo projects that are attempting to get folks to interact with, slow down enough to interact with and start to value and see not just weedy plants, but like any plant as not an object, rather as a living being that is active and interacting and bringing tremendous benefit in many cases to the landscape. Um, so depending on the person, there's different avenues. Um, I work with a dancer who does a lot of movement. So we were painting like yoga mats with giant silhouettes of weedy plants and then bringing the yoga mat to the weedy plant. And she was leading us through movement scenarios. That is totally not gonna reach some people, right? <laughs> so the, the um, I think the straightforwardness of like, oh, a blue flower. I wanna touch that blue flower because it might make this beautiful blue paint and someone's, with me telling me it's okay to do that and it's not gonna give me a rash and I'm not gonna get yelled at. Um, once you've actually physically done that, I'm really interested in like embodied forms of learning. Like you've touched that plant, you've felt it, you've, it's like different even than just seeing it to break it down and see what it smells like when you grind it into pigment and feel what it's like to brush the brush across the paper. Um, I think at least for some folks that can open up a really different way of relating to the urban habitat and start to bring these plants to the foreground as individuals rather than a mass of green. So there's that. I've, I've done a lot of seed collecting too um, through another project, the next Epoch Seed Library. And that's also a very physical, tangible, satisfying way to get folks out into the urban habitat. And you mentioned mapping and charting. Um, I find that I can, you know, I can make these maps, but I often need to facilitate the process of ground truthing them in a way, if you will, like get folks out in the landscape with me. And that's again, the, a way that this project is small. You know, it needs networks of lots of other people doing this kind of work to be in solidarity with, because I'm, you know, I think the best impacts are when I can say, yeah, I made this map of Hudson and you can see how the river's cut in half and this vine is growing across the municipal boundary. But if we go walk that together and you touch that vine and you collect paint, you have a, a really different understanding of your your local territory than than you would have prior. So uh, I like the work maps and charts can do towards abstraction, but I always find I want to connect it back to place. I guess. 
Um, do you also look at which feral plants are edible? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I'm not that, you know, that's not my main wheelhouse. There's so many amazing folks out there doing that work. Um, turn you to like Black Forager, for instance, on Instagram or The Curb, Collaborative Urban Resilience Banquet. So they're amazing folks doing a lot of really great work around edible ecologies. Um, but yeah, I am interested in that. You know, there's always with the landscapes that I'm foraging my pigment from, there's always the question of edibility because of the history of toxins. So you don't want to be eating any of this stuff in large amounts unless you're very confident that it doesn't have legacy chemicals or toxicity. So, um, and that's part of the pain of working with these habitats is like a certain sense of like unease around around how, um, what these plants are carrying in them, what kind of body burdens the plants have mm. or what they might transmit to you. Somebody had asked about kind of further up a, a bit, if you wear gloves when you're out collecting, <laughs> kind of thinking about that, what you just said. Yeah, I do sometimes. Sometimes I also wear a mask if I'm foraging somewhere that I think probably has heavy metals and I might be, you know, churning up the soil. Um, but often I don't. <laughs> Um, I know the plants well enough that I know which ones are likely to give me a rash or something like that. And I think the amount of contact that I have with them through harvesting them by hand isn't that bad, but I do open the window when I'm smashing them, depending on the plant species and make sure I have ventilation because I feel like breathing things inside me, um, mm -hmm. the kind of different, <laughs> different. I was doing that once with a mushroom that I found and it was so synthetic perfumey smelling that I got really freaked out. Like sometimes the smells smell so synthetic that you're like, what am mm -hmm. I breathing? Got to be careful, I guess. Yeah, there are little chemical factories, like I yeah, said. little chemical yeah. factories. Um, let's see. So you you mentioned Tree of Heaven. There's so much of this in my yard, and I want to use it for something other than chipping it. Have you worked with it? And if so, any interesting discoveries? You know, I haven't. I I, I make. I have a palette that's all green, for instance, because I I want to acknowledge that so much of the plant world is green, and Tree of Heaven is in that palette. You know, um, it doesn't do anything remarkable um, paint wise and the, the paint tends to break down faster. Greens are kind of not as stable, I found. Um, and it's a plant that we struggle with all the time here um, in the, uh, you work with a range of kind of urban wild gardens and we were trying lots of different strategies for living with Tree of Heaven. Um, some of them involve just cutting it down again and again. One involves kind of letting them get really tall and try to create a shade forest out of them. So instead of cutting them right way down at the base, we're cutting them up at the top. So they're more like palm trees um, and they re sprout up there and they're creating shade garden, like a shade canopy for a pollinator garden. But we're in there, you know, <laughs> yep. lovingly harvesting their babies. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't have many answers for that. Um, I know it's a challenging plant. Yeah. But I respect them. <laughs> Like we're in a drought and they are still green. Still green. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Samantha Verone who's also, well, she's in Brooklyn, but she's right now in Brooklyn, Maine. Uh, mm. said, and who works with Russ a lot and we've had her on Feedback mm. Friday. Said, we just pulled out a bunch of, is it, is it Cotum? Cotum? Cotonias. I thought it was- Cotton Easter. Cotton Easter. Easter. Thanks, Samantha. Yeah. Hot Easter. And do you have any experience with this plant? It's got berries on it and tiny shrubby leaves. I know the plant um, from when I lived in California. I feel like I saw it there more. I haven't encountered it in urban wilds here, but I should uh, keep my eyes open. So no, mm -hmm. be curious though. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, have you worked with, I think you, I think there was a slide that you did show this, but have you worked with younger people and showing them how to see plants make color apply color color yeah yeah I do a lot of that it's like a I mean I have a three-year-old daughter so down to her, yeah. her friends and her set um on up through you know elementary school and, and high school and college you get and, to see and, through her eyes yeah. too yeah yep for sure I really I think it's so valuable to do this work with kids they go in with many less inhibitions and and just like so hands-on immediately it's really fun yeah. Are there any lists, lists, book sources that identify plants that yield color that isn't fugitive? Mm. 
Um, not that I work from. I mean, I have to say like my arrival in the world of knowing slightly more about the technical aspects of, of ink making has, or pigment ma paint making, however you want to think about it, has been through what the plants have shown me. And then from that, you know, starting to do a little more research. So, um, yeah, sorry, I don't really <laughs> have anything helpful there. I do know there's guidebooks that I love for, yeah. for just identifying plants in general. I would recommend um, if you're in my part of the world, um, Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast. That's the plant, the book that I've worked with the most. And it has uh, sections on identification, but it also has like um, sections on kind of um, cultural significance and the plants interactions with humans over time. So that's yeah. a Peter Del Tredici. Book. Yeah, he's writing that down. There's also an app that I use all the time called PlantNet. And nice. so I know sometimes you don't want to have your phone on you when you're out in nature and you want to rather have a book in your back pocket or something or in your bag. But mm -hmm. I use, I'll take a picture of something and identify it. And then I will Google, you know, not weed, natural dyeing to see has somebody already done this. So sometimes it's just identifying the plant and then doing the research after. Totally. Yeah. And I think natural dyeing, there's a lot more, I've seen, you know, so much work on how to get it to be light fast and stay in the fabric. And yeah. So. yeah. Wow. People are writing these really long. So the chat is saved, uh, Ellie, so you can read this later, but people are really, some really good things here for you to read. Awesome. Thanks. That they want to talk with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's a question though. Have you have you done any eco printing with any of these feral plants or do you know others who do? Yeah, um, I have not, you know, it's something I always thought I would do at some point, maybe I still will. Um, but I mean, I've got a cyanotop type behind me. <laughs> it's not, not an eco print, but um, yeah, I don't really have anyone off the top of my head to recommend to look at that. Although I feel like I know people doing it. So if I come up with any ideas, I will, uh, I'll circle back around. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I can't believe, I mean, we never, we never gave you a heads up on this, but every single time we have feedback Friday, somebody says, well, what's that behind you? So somebody actually did say that. <laughs> they were wondering, if you're, are you using your plants to paint like that big, the picture behind you with a hand? And oh, cool. Yeah, no, that actually is a, a protest banner I made in collaboration. Um, yes, so I have this one, not this particular one is not done with um, with my plant pigments, but I have been mixing um, especially pokeweed and Asiatic dayflower into white acrylic paint that I have left over from my years as an acrylic painter, and I can do large scale paintings that way. So some of the like paintings on. I'm actually working on a series right now that's on um, the kind of black plastic you put down to try to suppress weeds. So I we've been trying to suppress this big patch of knotweed at Basilica and we cut a couple chunks out of it to see how it's doing underneath and I'm going to paint um, paintings on there that'll be part, you know, these this old acrylic storehouse that all that will be around forever and part plant pigment. So those are coming. That's great. Yep. Um, oh, somebody said Plant Snap is also a great app to use. Oh yeah, and on that um, note, I use iNaturalist a lot also, which is that civic science or community science app that I love because um, scientists who do research in the area of the often will jump in and give you like really concrete ideas and then you're kind of, or IDs, and then you're kind of contributing back to their, their data. So yeah. one, two. Okay. Let's see. I don't think lots well, just people saying thank you. Um, Kathy Green had written something. Everything gets buried so fast. Wonderful work. Invasive weeds make great paper too. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a definitely. Not flower press in New York. They, um, forgetting her first name suddenly, but Bat Flower Press does some really beautiful work with oh, invas cool. invasive weeds as really part of her practice with making paper. It's beautiful. Oh, cool. yeah. Bat flower? Bat flower. Oh, okay. Yeah. Look it up. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ellie. Yeah, Ellie. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you for letting us pause and breathe yes, as well. Yes. That was, that was really, really nice. Yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. You know, I, I think we 
I think we launch into either excitement or overwhelm so quickly, you know, that it's really great to just kind of let it seep and and infuse us, if you will, so that we're, we're we can carry it forward and think about it more. Mm -hmm. um, Really a lovely, lovely talk. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just kind of <laughs> glad just, everything worked out too. Yeah. Screen share. Looks yeah. Um, <laughs> it was awesome. Perfect. For helping me figure that out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank goodness. Um, so I'm just going to outro us and then we can unmute. Um, yeah. Those of you who are in this area, Seattle, we have a community indigo dip happening next Friday. Uh, I've got four monster vats that we need to like give a little bit of uh, attention to so that we can move them. And um, they're here for you guys. Uh, we're having two different sessions so that we don't overwhelm um, the space that we're in. So take a look at our website and please sign up. Um, you can bring one small item to dip. We'll also have indigo kits as well and um, vintage towels if you didn't bring anything but show up. So it's free, just RSVP, and we'll have a few things for sale if you're in the spending mode. Otherwise, just come and enjoy a little bit of time with us and with Abu Bakar Fofana and uh, hang out. Um. We also have, as I mentioned, the indigo dye bundles. Um, we've been selling quite a few of them. It's based on the one, two, three type indigo vat. And we have a fructose version, a henna version, and an iron or ferrous version. So depending on what your preference is or what you'd like to experiment with, you could try um, one or all three of them. So those are on the site. And then uh, the other huge discovery we made this last week with our mineral mud uh, workshop that just concluded is that um, we were looking for a red brown dye in order to be the tannin layer for these iron applications. And my goodness, I fermented some cherry ops about a month and a half ago in this bucket and we used it in our workshop and it's pretty spectacular yeah. what the color is on it. And um, it's used traditionally in Indonesia. It's an FSC, which is Forward Steward, Forward Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, no, that's matter. Oh, um, that's Forest Stewardship Council. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, certified. certified. Thank you. Certified um, harvester. And so those are the uh, the source of the dye for us, um, and yeah, we're we're really happy with what it looked like. Amy had a couple of pictures on, of it on our newsletter this week, and I believe if you look on the Cherry Ops um, product description, you also see a bunch of different pictures of the color yield. So yeah. have a look at that. And the cool thing is, you never throw it away; you just keep using it. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's really gorgeous. Dip, we had a Port Portofirio Gutierrez was here for the class too and put in some white Oxford shirts. And yeah, they came out without even more than two. I know though. Beautiful. The Portofirio button down shirt is now <laughs> a cherry yeah. ops color. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that's what's for um, this week. And then stay tuned. Oh, we also got Marigold Mix on sale. <laughs> it's a beautiful, bright, um slightly orange based gold yellow gold it's i say lovely. it's the happiest color we have cassie it's, pre it's pretty darn happy it's happy. um so, <laughs> so anyway um stay tuned we'll have our next is am i the next no keith Rucker. no 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 nope. nope. uh we have don't somebody worry. We'll There's remember definitely somebody, but you might, somebody be fabulous. you might be before. And uh, I'm also going to be doing a uh, Wednesday one hour info on um, Mordentine, right? Yeah. Oh, we have new an, a, a new Morden coming out. So I'm yeah. going to do a um, an info infomercial <laughs> on that. So look for that as well. And without any further ado, let's just unmute and say hello to everybody. Yeah. Let's remove the spotlight. Remove that spotlight. Remove it. Move it. Here we Hello go. Hello and goodbye. <laughs>
Hi guys. Hi, Helen. Hi, Hi guys. guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Have Bye. a good Bye. weekend. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Really cool. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Ellie. Oh, Catherine. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Elaine. I know. I see Elaine. Nice to see you guys. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Fun to actually meet you in person. Yeah. I'm so mad. I didn't get to see you. Oh yeah. I think we were just like ships passing yeah, in the night here. Just by a few days. But you guys I know. Just... Part of me is like, how can I get back uh, up yeah. there for the indigo? <laughs> yeah. I get to see a couple people tomorrow, I guess, too. Nice. On Monday. Oh, Monday. What is it tomorrow? tomorrow I keep saying Saturday. Tomorrow. 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 I love ya. Tomorrow. <laughs> we didn't mean to do that. Uh, we're recording still. We're still. Oh, yeah, let's stop. <laughs>